I, I really like that analogy, Eduardo, because I've always said agility comes from within and our soul, of course, is within us. That's where agility comes from, not from without, not from the tools, the techniques, the practices that we follow. Hello, everyone. My name is Eduardo Martins, and this is Agility Talks. Uh, and today I have a special guest. Uh, it's Kiron Bodeo. Here's your book, Is Interior Difficult Practice? I believe it's in Amazon for everyone to buy, Kiron. Absolutely. It's available on Amazon, Indigo Chapters, Barnes and Noble, in both paperback and ebook formats. Uh, it's very reasonably priced. Um, so definitely uh, it's useful for anybody that is a in leading initiatives whether you've been doing it for 30 years or you're just starting there's probably some lessons in there that will be helpful and i like to think of it as a field guide and it always starts uh with uh four of these values so the alma framework uh that represents the essence of your company and i'm not sure if you know Kiron, but Alma is the Portuguese and Spanish word for soul. So the idea is that actually why you apply the framework and the lessons we will learn with you that you share in your book, it can serve as a guide so you can really see the soul of your team. I, I really like that analogy, Eduardo, because I've always said agility comes from within and our soul, of course, is within us. That's where agility comes from, not from without, not from the tools, the techniques, the practices that we follow. That what I believe too. So that's great. We are perfectly aligned. So within uh, our soul, I propose uh, us to work in four key agile values. To motivation. And the key question for motivation in the Alma framework you know, is why are you doing this? Uh, and uh, for the framework itself, it describes how and who follows the company vision. So it starts from the top. Uh, I'm not sure if there are companies out there that still do not have a vision, but certainly there are companies out there that do not know anything about what is to have a vision. But <laughs> let's take it this way, zero. One, uh, we have a vision somewhere, uh, and I believe like, at least from my experience, like, and if we talk in a more like modern concept, uh, we talk about purpose and not vision anymore, but uh, I know that there's a lot of companies out there uh, that has that have many years uh, like companies uh, with like 10 15 years that wrote uh, that uh, vision or that purpose uh, someday I don't know in their 30 years anniversary and it stays there no one reveals that <laughs> and uh, people are really not engaged with it and, and, and the main purpose of a vision of, of or a purpose itself is to be able to engage people, right? To be able to motivate people. Absolutely, and that's where uh, I, I'm a firm believer in uh, what Daniel Pink writes about in his book, Drive, that if you want to unleash intrinsic motivation, purpose is extremely important. And so many authors have written about that. Simon Sinek, start with why. I mean, what's the yeah. reason that we want to know why? Well, it's about purpose, right? Exactly. I mean, Lencioni and his writings talks about the importance of that as well. So I, I, looking through my book, I found three articles that I felt really tied to this concept of personal motivation. And the first one is, is it's, it, it's a, an article I wrote after I read Patrick Lencioni's book, Three Signs of a Miserable Job. Uh -huh. And in that book, what Lencioni said is that how do we know that someone is not motivated? Well, there were three things that he pointed out. He said, do they feel irrelevant? Do they feel that their work can't be measured? He called it immeasurability. And do they feel that, that, they, that, that the work they do doesn't matter to anybody that way? And so this is where that really talks about the concept of purpose again. So as a project manager, we are in a really good position to be able to help people understand why are we working on this project? How does what we're doing contribute exactly. to the greater good, contribute to realizing the vision for our company? And an example of how we do that is maybe during your project kickoff, you bring the sponsor into the room to talk about the criticality of this project. What's the outcome? How is it going to benefit the company? How is it going to benefit this team member? That's how we start to create that sense of motivation. Because otherwise, exactly. it's just a job. It's something that, yeah, I could do this, but I could do something a lot more interesting that way. 
Um, so it's very important that as project managers, we need to recognize we may not have formal authority over our team members, but we're in a very good position to be able to help our team members start to see that what they're working on is gonna make a difference and to be able to show them the fruits of their labor, to show them an opportunity to, to illustrate the great work that they're doing. And that's one of the reasons why I really love agile approaches. Because if you think about a predictive approach to a project, a team member might work for months and months and months on a deliverable. Without seeing anything, right? Without yeah. Seeing any results. And then when that deliverable is done, maybe they're giving it to the next person in the value stream, but exactly. it's not the customer. <laughs> they don't see the connection to the customer. Whereas in an agile way, it's the short feedback loop. The work we do, we should see that feedback all the way to our customer fairly quickly and, and we get that recognition. So for example, if we're following Scrum and we're doing a sprint review, that's a great opportunity for team members to see, here's the work I did over the past sprint and getting that direct feedback from the stakeholders. Wow, that looks exactly. really interesting. This is really gonna help solve my business problem. That creates a lot of motivation. And, and more than that, uh, you know, what I've seen like in my career here, here with the companies uh, is that uh, you need to be able to link that uh, value that you're delivering with your customer with the achievable goals of your team. So let's say, let's do a value-driven approach within a uh, uh, feature itself. So until we do not uh, reach, let's say, 10% uh, usability of that feature, the way that we designed that, it doesn't end, right? So really tie uh, the, the the measurable uh, UI goals or the measurable uh, customer goals or client goals when you talk about the concept of MBI, it's about that, right? So it's about being able to show the value and make sure that this value is perceived by the people who made it. Exactly, exactly. The second article which I wrote is, is it's a very simple model that I proposed a few years ago for how do we get uh, individual satisfaction and engagement and motivation from team members. And I, and I called it the three C's model. So the first C is capacity. The second one is capability. And the third one, and this ties to motivation, is commitment, getting the commitment from our team members. Uh -huh. And one of the other aspects of commitment, which a project manager is able to address, is around recognition. Now, recognition, when we think about that in the workplace, many times we immediately think about, well, I'm going to get a bonus or there's a trophy or an award of yep. some kind. This is formal recognition. Yep. It's great. I mean, it's wonderful if a project manager has a budget to be able for doing to that. Yeah, but but it's not about it's not about the numbers, right? But it's not about the money. Um, the book, uh, The Carrot Principle, which Gostick uh, wrote a few years ago, they, they provide 200 examples of ways of recognizing individuals that don't cost a cent. Um, they've done studies that show that if a person is not recognized at least once a week, their motivation starts to come down. And it's very simple. I mean, it's, it's things like being able to appreciate the individual as a unique individual. Um, greeting them every day, uh, getting to know them so you know when maybe something's not quite right, something's off, maybe they're a little bit down. Um, when the pandemic's over and we're working in person again, if you notice that they seem to be stressed saying, hey, can I take you out for a coffee? Uh, tell me what's going on. Uh, when they do something small that was meaningful, thanking them for it, saying thank you. These are all methods of recognition that are so powerful at helping to rekindle motivation. Yeah, for sure. And, and I have a great story to share on that. Like when we when we engage at a personal level, I, I had a team member at a time that he was really demotivated for a bunch of situations in the project. And we know that we have a lot of that. Uh, but uh, somewhat he was key for one of uh, uh, the pieces that we had on a technical standpoint of view. Uh, and he was really a great fan of badminton. But I didn't know nothing about badminton, uh, badminton at, the, at that point. But, and what I did as a leader was understanding how badminton works or at least uh, start to understand a little bit to be able to have some starting point for a conversation with him so I could get, her, uh, get more closely to his universe 
and I was able to get from there like a much more better individual that was able to deliver the promises. He uh, started to get more engaged within the team because of that, because uh, people, uh, he was, uh, even other team members like that were not like interested in badminton, he was able to show how this works and people got interested. So it's about that, right? Getting about that personal level. Absolutely. I mean, and I, again, it goes back to sort of that three signs of a miserable job, the concept of anonymity. If you as a leader view your people as a resource and one resource is the same as another and you don't take the time to actually get to know them and understand them as unique human beings, in a way, you're being uh, you're not being inclusive. This is not a way of being inclusive it, because everyone has a story to tell. Everyone has something that they're great at. Take the time to understand that. Understand what makes them tick, what gets them excited, what are their hopes and dreams. If you have those conversations with your team members and you remember what you've heard, you can now have some powerful levers to be able to help to unleash that motivation. Yeah, for sure. That's great. And and before we, we get to engage remote team members uh, here, Kiran, uh, one of the, the things that I, I believe that uh, most organizations also fails uh, is, a, is how to translate that purpose into achievable goals and then uh, into achievable uh, metrics or uh, achievable uh, pieces until you get that to the people level, right? So most organizations are, okay, uh, I have a vision or I have a purpose. It's clear for everyone. Great, everyone knows about that. But have, were you able to translate that goals to your team leadership? Where the team leadership was able to define the space uh, for each individual about what they own and how this relates to that purposes, right? And I believe this is kind of key here for motivation. Majority of the organizations are, uh, I don't know, maximum three and for really being able to unleash the motivation at a team personal level you need to be able to understand how to translate that uh, uh, purpose into achievable goals so team leadership knows what they uh, need to go for but also at a people level how they contribute to that uh, KPI or to that goal because I also do not believe uh, in individual metrics because they can really be gamed uh, very easily, right? So it's a team goal, but people need to know what is their part on that, right? Absolutely. And that's where, unfortunately, too many times we see siloed metrics where uh, there might be some high level uh, objectives for the organization, but when those get cascaded down to the individual teams, you start to see individual KPIs at the team level that are actually in conflict with one another. Yep. And that's why frameworks such as OKRs, for example, are very powerful because that helps to create cross-organization alignment as well as traceability from the team level all the way up to the higher level purpose. The challenge is, like every other framework, the idea is solid, but the implementation is where failures occur. Exactly. For every for every company that does a good job implementing OKRs, there'll be 10 companies that fail at that being able to do that. But yes, having that cascading of KPIs in a manner that creates organizational alignment is, is absolutely critical. And then the final article that I found that aligned with the concept of motivation is, is very, I would say, topical with the world we live in today. Exactly. The pandemic, most of our teams are remote teams. We have dispersed team members. And if you've never worked with a group of people before and suddenly you're in a leadership position with this group of dispersed team members, how do you go about engaging them? Especially in a time like now when it's not just about working remotely, people are having their kids at home. Maybe their, their partner has lost their job. Maybe they're worried about a parent who might get sick because of COVID. How do you engage people so that they can get the job done, but they're also looking after themselves? And so some of the ideas that I share in the article are things like it's so important to have a meaningful kickoff, that that kickoff meeting is your first best chance to start to create a sense of identity for the team, to start to get people to know one another. It's also really important to get good working agreements in place, develop those ground rules with the team, have them discover that, but take the time to do that. 
It's also really important that just because you're away from them, don't use that as an excuse to micromanage them. Yep. If you were working there's a with fine them, line right between. There's a fine line yeah. there. Sometimes what happens is if we can't see those people every day, we might be tempted to start to micromanage them. And we don't want to do that. We want to give them outcomes that they're going to be trying to achieve, measure them based on the results, not on necessarily the effort they're putting in or are they online at a particular day or how quickly are they responding to an email. These are these these to me are a byproduct. Focus on what is being achieved as a team that way. And I think it's also important that we take time to celebrate, to recognize and to also understand that there are going to be challenges for everyone that's working in this remote mode. There's going to be days when somebody simply is not going to give you 100% because they have something else going on. Maybe a family member is sick. Maybe they have to pick up their kid from school early because the kid was coughing and yep. they've been sent home. And we need to demonstrate that empathy. Yes. And, and, and show that we see them as a human being with all the strengths and weaknesses that come with that, that's again how we're going to go about engaging or motivating them. Exactly, and acknowledging that, right? That that we we have this problem, these problems, and it's it's common. Everyone has these problems, right? But uh, how you show that empathy, how you show that care, is really how you make the difference here, right? And uh, Look, uh, uh, I had a conversation with, with Scott that was in Agility Talks too, Scott Ambler, and we were talking really about uh, remote teams and the concept of remote, remote teams and the discipline agile mindset or the agile mindset. And uh, we came uh, uh, to the agreement that all these problems that we, we were talking about here, we're already out there. And what COVID really did is just enhancing that problems because Absolutely. we already had problems with alignment we already had problems with like making sure that people are motivated before uh, now these problems were much more enhanced so we needed to deal more with them right Absolutely. So, I, I mean, I, and I think I fully agree with that, that it's not that it's introduced necessarily a net new challenge. What it's done is it's taken existing challenges and potentially aggravated them. And that means that as project managers or as leaders of teams, we need to put that much more effort into actively listening, into demonstrating true empathy, into establishing psychological safety within our teams. Uh, into being that true servant leader. Because if we try to take that traditional command and control type approach with our teams in this time when they are so stressed out, they're just going to disengage. We're going to lose Exactly. People. Exactly. And, and within a time like that, that, that like all the work is being done remotely, it's much easier for people to move positions to, right? So you need to acknowledge that and work to enable your team so they can actually feel motivated and they can produce more and then can feel more engaged. And, and like you really start like producing better and better people this way. Absolutely.